welcome back. So this lecture is going to deal with principles of exercise training and conditioning. We're going to dive into how the body adapts to exercise, the importance of that, like what is hypertrophy and how fast the body recovers. We're talking about muscle building and different things of that nature. The point of this is we're going to take this lecture, the cardiovascular lecture, the muscle and strength, and kind of put them all together so that towards the end of this section, you can put together your own workout routine and understand why it's important to exercise um, you know, this many times for cardiovascular for fitness versus I want to lift this certain way versus this certain way to gain muscle strength and power. So this lecture is going to dive in moderately to the exercise physiology behind why we work out. So I hope you enjoy it. So let's go through, th through some of these. The first thing I want to talk about are some definitions. Right? Commonly in exercise physiology, we talk and we hear about things like muscle strength, muscle power, and muscle endurance. Well, let's break some of these out. Muscle strength is the maximum amount of force that a muscle or muscle group can generate. All right? So that a maximum contraction that it can perform. A lot of times people will assess these by using one rep maxes. So they'll put on the maximum amount of weight they can do on a bench press and, and lift it one time. There's also things called three rep max, five rep max, so forth and so on, but it's all an assessment of muscle strength. Power is defined as the rate of performing the work, all right, thus kind of the product of force and velocity. So you can see power equals force times distance divided by time, which is that velocity factor, all right. And then muscle endurance is the ability of a muscle or muscle group to repeatedly sustain near maximal or maximal contractions such as in the example of sit-ups or push-ups or different things like that. So what does this all mean? We, we're, when we work out, we want to try to lift, and we're, we're talking about lifting weights, not cardiovascular fitness, but pure strength. We want to try to lift in one of three ways, and really, really just one way. But we have muscle strength and power, and that is an athletic form of lifting, and that's what we want because it's going to give us the best benefit. Then there's muscle endurance, which has its place, especially for the core and stabilizing muscles. But overall, we don't want to just lift endurance for all of our legs and things, because especially in firefighting and, and those kind of related tasks, we need to be able to be explosive and carry heavy amounts of weight most of the time. And then the last stage, and we haven't talked about these, and I'll get more in depth in them in, them in a later lecture, is we want to be able to to lift, or we we don't want to lift for the body the bodybuilding or the beach body. So those guys are are lifting totally different. They're really breaking things down, and we'll get into those here later. So I just wanted to give you that heads up. So here's some general principles that we always want to think about, um, and not just factors, but actual principles we're going to think about. So the first one is individuality. All right, any tra uh, training program must consider the specific needs and abilities of the individual for whom it is designed. All right, so we're going to individualize this program and make it specific to them. Perfect example of this is within sport. We are going to treat a soccer player much differently than we are a football player. And we can go even more specific to that. If we take just a football team, we're going to treat offensive linemen different than we are a running back or than we are maybe a quarterback. We're going to make that, sp that program very individualized to them. Adaptations to training are highly specific to the nature of the training activity and should be carefully matched to an athlete's specific performance needs. Again, a quarterback needs to work on ballistic, out-of-the-pocket type of motion and needs to work on throwing mechanics and all those types of things versus an offensive lineman who is moved or designed to move people around. So those two athletes, even within that own sport, are going to be very, very different compared to, let's take a, um, a receiver compared to a defensive back. A receiver is doing a lot of forward motion, a defensive back is doing a lot of backward motion. So we're going to have a very unique type of specificity. We need to account for reversibility. And what reversibility is, is the body's um, downplay and we're going to talk about some graphs when we get there a little bit later but basically you know we've been working out for six weeks when we stop the body is really good at being lazy and it wants to go back to um, a level of minimal performance for lack of a better term and we'll talk a little bit more specifically about this when we get to the the next few slides so let's talk about the factor of overload. here's a really cool thing called the said principle the said principle stands for specific adaptation to impose to man. If you break this down into layman's terms, what it means is if you don't use it, you lose it. And this applies to just about everything in the human body. For example, 
It applies to cardiac tissue, skeletal muscle tissue, it applies to bone density, blood volume, all these different kinds of things. If we put specific demands on the body, the body is going to adapt, all right? And let's take the thing just as simple as bone density. We've all probably heard, or if we haven't, you're going to hear it now, that one of the ways that we can prevent or slow down the progression of osteoporosis is through weight-bearing exercise. When we put specific demands of bearing weight through the joints and through the bones, the body reacts to these stresses at a cellular environment and increases the amount of like osteoclasts and osteocytes in the cells. And these are the building blocks of bone tissue. So when we go out and we do weight-bearing exercises like walking, hiking, running, jogging, free weights, putting weight through the body and through the joints and bones, the body adapts to that and it says, hey, I'm getting all these stresses and I need to ramp up my osteocytes for lack of a, a better term and these are the cells kind of at that level and increase the density of bone. It does the same thing through cardiac tissue and skeletal muscle tissue. When we put specific demands like free weight exercise and we start lifting, all right, and we're doing more than our body is normally used to, it's going to increase the tissue of that. It doesn't do that right away. We're going to talk about neuromuscular um, involvement, but eventually it will say, hey, I, I got to increase and I got to kind of adapt to this and increase tissue. The bad thing about it is when we stop, we're really good at being lazy, and we're going to talk about that here in just a minute. This, this said principle, the specific adaptation to impose demand, is huge, and it, it, it's a vital component of training whether it be free weight training, skeletal muscle tissue, cardiac or aerobic training, whatever it might be. On a side note, stress should not be great enough to cause injury before the body has had a chance to adjust to this increased demands. And this is a very fine balance. One of the things that you'll hear about is, you know, like when it comes to like maybe sports medicine is, are you injured or are you hurt? Well, I use that kind of same theory of, are you sore or are you in pain? If you go and you work out and you go home and you're like, oh, I am sore, especially like 24, 48 hours later, that's a good thing. If we don't have that soreness, we're not putting enough demand on. But if you go home and 24, 48 hours, you can barely move or touch your knees and your joints and your elbows, and you're like, oh my God, I'm in pain, then you did way too much. And so there's a very fine balance of we want to do so much that we are overloading, we're opposing these huge specific demands but not doing so much that we're causing a breakdown in the tissue. And this is a very fine balance. Warm up. I mean, we've all probably done a warm up, um, you know, but the whole point of this is it's to be cautious against unnecessary injuries uh, and sometimes muscle soreness. What should a good warm up consist of? Here's what I like to do. You know, in the sports medicine side of my career, I'll have people come in and throw five or six hot packs on their body or sit in a warm whirlpool. The best way to warm up is by moving, all right? Get on a bike, run, jog, whatever it might be. Increase our core temperature. Love a bike. It's a great way to warm up. But if you don't have a bike, um, you know, just a light jog for five, ten minutes. Enough where you start to break a very, very mild sweat, and then you shut it down. So cool down. All right, we're going to talk about all the other stuff in the middle. But cool down enables the body to return to a resting state. It may decrease muscle soreness. Um, it what should a cool down consist of? You know, again, light jog, same thing as a warm up. You're you're basically trying to flush all of the byproducts of exercise. So we're going to clear lactic acid out. We're going to flush unwanted free radicals out of the body and get rid of them so the body can buffer them down and process them out. Let's talk some, talk a little more about some different types of training techniques um, to improve now cardiovascular endurance or aerobic fitness. So they have there, there's one called continuous training. It consists of frequency at least three sessions per week, intensity critical in early stages, uh, heart rate needs to be elevated to at least 70% of our maximum heart rate, so that Carvonin formula um, has to be at least 70% or higher, uh, must be aerobic, and it must be at least 20 minutes in length. And what they're saying now, um, these, these parameters have probably changed just a little bit, um, we need to do 90 minutes of intense exercise a week as it relates to aerobic fitness or 120 minutes of moderate. So I would put this at moderate. 70% 20 minutes is a moderate workout. It is not an intense workout. And so um, you're gonna have to do this more like five times a week to make that 120 minute. If you were doing 80 to 85% at 20 minutes, 
um, to 30 minutes, then we're looking at more of that 90 minute range of just being able to get away with doing it three times a week. Then we have interval training, um, alternates periods of intense work at, uh, um, work and active recovery. Um, so this is like, you know, the old school Indian run, if you've ever done those, where you have a team of, you know, 20 people, you do two lines of 10, and when the, when the coach blows the whistle, you sprint to the front, and then you jog. Um, and that's actually a little bit more like the fart lick we're going to talk about here in a minute. But this is interval, you know. You're going to do 80% of your maximum heart rate and then drop to about 30%. And it might be, you know, 30 second burst with 30 second um, relax. You might do 80% for 30 seconds and then 30% for 30 seconds and back and forth. And then speed play is, is a type of interval training, a.k.a. fartlek. And I know that sounds really funny, but it was um, a, a, a physicist or a doctor, I can't remember, in uh, Germany, I believe, a long time ago that kind of came up with this. Very similar to interval training. Um, varied terrains often surge in the workout. This is that you know, sprint, walk, sprint, walk, or sprint, jog. Very, very quick, high intensity, and then you're going to kind of jog at a... 70% maximum heart rate for the rest of the time. Let's talk about hypertrophy. So hypertrophy, which is the opposite of atrophy, all right, let me define atrophy first, I guess. Atrophy is the body's um, wasting away, for lack of a better term. So, you know, if we have an injury to our, our right knee and our, our um, leg is, you know, got to be on crutches for six weeks, that right leg is going to atrophy very severely, and it's going to waste away and go down to a very minimal level. <clears throat> in fact, if we talk about atrophy and cardiovascularly, um, there's some studies that indicate that I believe they took a sample population of about 200 people, just random individuals, and would not allow them to work out for six weeks. They had to be on bed rest for six weeks. And their VO2 max, which is the amount of oxygen you can use during exercise and, and cardiac output, went down and decreased by more than 25%, which is phenomenal in just a short six-week um, interval. So that's, that's an atrophy type of thing. Hypertrophy is the opposite. When we put stresses on the muscles and we put forces through them, the body's going to react and gain. All right? So muscle fibers are composed of those myofilaments that we talked back in muscle tissue, which was like week three, I believe. Um, which are the contractile fibers within the muscle itself. They increase in size and number as a result of strength training. So the more training we put through the muscle, the more of these myofibrils or myofilaments that we're going to create. Um, another theory is more oxygen and more blood increases capillaries, but it's shown that only a few capillaries are really formed in reality. So um, the mo majority of hypertrophy comes from actually increasing the myofilaments. All right. So... Here's the good news. We can increase the number of muscle cells and the size of the cells All right, when we strength train. Here's the bad news. If you started working out, say you hadn't worked out in two years and you're like, okay, I'm going to get my butt in gear and I'm going to start working out now, you actually don't gain any true muscle tissue or muscle fibers for about the first six to eight weeks. And what I mean by that is we actually have this thing called neuromuscular efficiency. All right, and what we do is we become really, really efficient at using the amount of fibers that we already have. And what I mean by that is if we look at this chart down here, this is week one, all right, and we do a bench press. Our bench press is 100 pounds. Then by week two, it goes to 110, 120. You can see the first six weeks, our one rep max just absolutely spikes. It's not because we're gaining any tissue at all. It's because in this first six weeks, we're recruiting the most amount of muscle fibers that we can, and we're becoming very, very efficient at using a neuro or neuromuscular system. At first, we might only be able to recruit 80% of all of our muscle fibers at any one given time. By the time we get to the six, eight week range, we're able to recruit all 100% of those muscle fibers, and now the body's like, hey, I'm becoming as efficient as I can, and I need to start gaining muscle tissue. That's why we plateau, and it's a lot slower at increasing. You can see week six through like 12 I have here, we've only gone from maybe 135 pounds to maybe 142 pounds here. Our gain is nothing compared to the first six weeks. And that's what we call neuromuscular efficiency. So we've talked a little bit about overtraining already. Um, you know, it can cause a very negative effect. It can result in physiological and psychological breakdown. You know, an athlete that is just doing too much 
puts themselves at a really high risk of you know things like tendonitis, tendinosis, and all these things we've talked about. Plus, it's just mentally taxing. Let's move on to reversibility. All right, <laughs> kind of some good news and bad news here again. Good news is our body is very, very reactive. All right, and we can we can change things. We can increase both our muscle strength and our cardiovascular endurance. All right, and our body does it with fair ease, for lack of a better term. I mean, we got to put stresses through it, but it's pretty reactive. Here's the problem. It also is really, really good at being very, very lazy. And reversibility is the body's natural path to want to be as lazy and as efficient and use the least amount of sources that it can. So what I have here, um, let's, it's just adaptations in the muscle in response to resistance. Training can begin to reverse in as little as 36 hours as it relates to cardiac tissue and 72 hours as it relates to skeletal muscle strength. Now. These figures are things that I was taught when I was in school. I have done a lot of research in the last couple days to try to find stuff to back this up, and I can't. The best study I can find is the one I kind of alluded to earlier where they took um, like 200 people and they basically put them on bed rest for six, uh, six weeks and their VO2 max decreased by 25%. So I'm going to try to see if I can dig up um, a little bit more information to find these hours. And uh, I was looking through some old notes when I was going to Fresno State and that's kind of the, what I was taught, but that was probably nine years ago, so I don't know if there's any new research out there on that. And like I said, I've looked in four or five different exercise science textbooks that I have. I've talked to some um, colleagues that teach biology, human biology with me, and I, none of us can really find anything. So I'll dig into this a little bit more for you guys. But it, reversibility is a real thing. Whether this time frame is 100% accurate or not, or this is just something I was taught, maybe it's kind of gone by the wayside, we do have reversibility. So what, what I'm showing you here is, you know, week one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, we've worked out, we've started increasing, and we'll relate this to cardiovascular fitness, all right? Then at week 10, we say, you know what? It's Christmas break, Thanksgiving break. I'm gonna take some time off. If it's cardiac tissue, from my understanding, within about 36 hours, it's gonna start to fall off the chart. So here's why that's so important. Cardiovascularly, we need to, train minimally of twice a week if we want to maintain. If we were to graph twice a week, what you'd see is, like if we did you know, seven days, you'd see boom, spike up, down, up, down, up, down. And we would just stay flatline, which for some people is fine. They just want to maintain. If we want to gain cardiovascular fitness, we have to work out minimally three times a week. All right, now skeletal muscle tissue is a lot better. It's about 72 hours. So in order to maintain, you could probably get away with working out once a week skeletal and you can gain with twice a week, however it's encouraged to work out at least three times a week. So I recommend cardiovascular fitness five days a week and weight training skeletal muscle mass three days a week. And that's if you're doing total body conditioning. If you're going to do legs, then you need to do legs like Monday, Wednesday, arms, Tuesday, Thursday, so that way you're getting at least twice a week. We've talked about circuit training a little bit, um, and circuit training basically is just moving from station to station. The nice thing about it is is you're moving so so fast and so randomly that um, you're keeping your heart rate elevated. So you're getting both muscle strength out of it and cardiovascular fitness out of it. So I hope you've gotten a lot out of this lecture. It was a lot of physiology and things really related to sports and exercise phys. Um, but again, a firefighter is an athlete. So I use those terms interchangeably. I took some lecture materials out of a, an exercise science class that I had and modified them a little bit. But again, you know, a, fire, a firefighter is no different than uh, a football player, a wide receiver, offensive lineman, wrestler, whatever. You guys are doing ballistic types of performances just like an athlete would. And really, athletics and, and sports medicine exercise fitness has gotten into the pure fitness and the industrial side of fitness. So um, there's some lectures after this talking about personal workouts and how to design a workout. And so I hope you guys get a lot out of that and can tie it back into this lecture.